Hey everyone, I'm Raj. I'm a trauma investor surgeon from NUH, as uh, Professor has mentioned, and um, I'll just share with you a little bit, just about a five-minute tour, in a sense, of what um, our COVID-19 ready operating room looks like. Um, these are rooms that we use specifically for patients who are COVID suspects or COVID positives, and um, increasingly we are seeing greater and greater use of these rooms. And I thought it, were, it will be good to just give you a pictorial diagram of exactly how this works. In, um, in the tertiary hospital in Singapore. Um, so we'll run through some of the principles of running a COVID-19 OT. Um, later, my colleagues will be giving a discussion on the anesthetic components and specific surgical points, which I won't be covering in this, but this is more of an infrastructural setup that we're going to be discussing. Um, we'll also be going through some key learning points that we have encountered from our initial experience in using such a theater. Now, I think the key principle in organizing this within your own hospitals, if, if it's not already set up, is essentially a focus on staff safety. Um, protocols will need to be rewritten um, because this is a very new um, disease that we are tackling. Um, we may have had previous um, precautions for infectious disease cases, but some of those may have been not used for a while, and sometimes we need to review and redevelop some of these protocols, including the screening, the transport, transfer, intraoperative and postoperative um, management protocols. Um, along with this is also, of course, the decision making for surgery. Do we really need surgery? Do we need general anesthesia? And reducing the impact of procedures which require aerosolization, which has a greater risk to staff safety. Uh, we can't emphasize the need for PPE and training more, um, and just being Having PP itself is only one half of the equation. You do need to ensure that everyone is trained in to, to use it. And many people would have completed their PP training long ago and may have forgotten or may have been a bit rusty in its use. And we found that there was a big gap in the number of people who needed retraining um, during this period of time. And lastly, of course, the importance of drills and rehearsals in managing uh, and to make sure it's a safe environment for everyone. In my hospital, what we have is uh, we are privileged to have a negative pressure theater. So this is a theater which was built in right from the beginning. And this actually allows us to operate on infected cases without contamination of the rest of the OT facility. For institutes without this, um, this kind of a theater, additional precautions will be need to be taken in terms of I keep having an operating room in a far corner of your operating complex as far as possible and with an ingress and egress pathways which are different from the majority of patients. In a sense, patients should enter this theater through a particular pathway and leave through a particular pathway to minimize contact with others. So as you can see from this diagram here, the picture on the left is essentially the pathway entering um, this theater uh, and it's segregated as you can see from the overall uh, map on the right that is quite segregated from everywhere else so in order to minimize contact. So if you have a negative pressure theater, good. If you don't, at the very least, try to create a theater at the corner of your complex away from everyone when you're operating on COVID suspect or positive cases. Um, the area outside is dedicated to our personal protective equipment and most of the donning and doffing of our PP is done in this area, including the use of PAPRs. Uh, PAPRs especially are used for aerosol generating, generating procedures and our anesthetists use them for intubation as well. Other surgical procedures like tracheostomies, all this we, we do as a, as, as a principle, we do encourage the use of PAPR. However, as a minimum, we require everyone to be uh, wearing a full gown and 95 masks and goggles during uh, this procedure. Um, this is the area outside the theatre for people to start wearing this before entering the operating theatre. Um, we, we ensure that there's um, good labeling and a, that everything is quite easily um, identifiable so that new people who are coming to the theater for the first time we were, will be very clear on where to put their various items. Now, every negative pressure theater has an anti room, and an anti room is basically a room which is kept separate from the main operating theater at all, at all times. Um, this In this room, most of our scrub staff are preparing the equipment. All the temporary equipment is kept here. And you can see that in this room, there's a second door before it enters the main operating theater. And this door will not open until the door of the antechamber to the external environment is closed. So in that sense, making sure that there's no co uh, continuous communication from inside the theater to the external. 
So these are these are doors which are electronically configured that if one door opens, the other door must remain closed. And in that way, it prevents things from going. In hospitals which don't have this computerized facility, then manually we have to make that adjustment to make sure that there's no constant communication between the internal operating theater environment and the rest of the theater complex. So that's one area to look at for. And this is where scrub nurses who are preparing the equipment and who are on the way to removing equipment, bring the equipment to and waiting for the door, the internal door to close before it can be redistributed out. Um, signages are everywhere to make, to make sure that people are clear on what the protocols are. We don't get people running in of the theater straight out. We, for every single case, we have a runner who is there to basically help you run from theater to theater to get the various items that you need. But every time you do that, there's going to be a delay as you wait for the various doors to open and close and for the pressurization to normalize. Um, clear labeling and signages are important everywhere so that people are constantly reminded on how to do it. Um, I wanted to make an emphasis on the importance of security and environmental services in these kind of handling of these patients. So we use the security staff to clear the way um, before or when as the patient's arriving to minimize contact with the public and other patients. We, we have environmental services who will basically help to clean up the lifts to wipe, to wipe things down whenever the patient has used it to minimize the impact on the other patients and visitors to the hospital. And these are some of the simple safety measures you can take as the inner hospital to try to uh, minimize, uh, to maximize patient and staff safety. Now, this is a picture of a normal OR in my hospital and how it's usually set up um, in a non, for non-infective cases. You can see it's full of equipment. Um, this is the scrub preparation room on the right. You can see it's full of uh, drawers and equipment and uh, things for you to utilize for surgery so that things are very quickly uh, available. However, in our COVID theaters, it's not so. Everything is emptied out. We remove every piece of non-essential equipment uh, out of it and we only bring in equipment that we need. And we do this in order to minimize contamination of equipment and to reduce the cleaning burden because cleaning the theater at the end of surgery is a huge task. And if you reduce the number of items within it, you'll be able to turn over the theater much faster. So this is an important component and it means they need a lot of planning because you're not gonna have all your equipment ready to go uh, when you start surgery and you need to get everything pre-prepared. So you only bring in what's essential before you start surgery. Now, and, uh, and just to reiterate the point, keep the, keep the theaters as empty as possible. Just bring in what you need prior. And it's important for everyone to meet up and huddle prior to surgery so that you know how to prepare and predict for not only what you expect to need, but also for to a certain amount of for contingency planning so that you have extra equipment in case you require more than what you initially imagined. There are a few issues for surgical staff as well, which is a bit of a change from peacetime. Um, one, we try to minimize the surgical team. We try to make it as small as possible using senior members to reduce the exposure to staff, especially to the juniors. Uh, having a senior staff also may correlate to a faster operation, fewer complications, and minimize, minimizes time of exposure to all healthcare workers. Um, do note that um, if a senior staff member does get COVID at the older age, especially more than 60, there is an implication there as well. So you've got to balance this out. But in essence, get a team who is capable of the job. There's not a training opportunity and as few people as possible in theater. Uh, make sure your pre-training is done as mentioned so that everyone is ready to go. And on top of that, if I may add, we, have, we try to use a buddy system so that um, each surgeon cross-checks his uh, PPE before going in to make sure that they are properly gowned up and there are no gaps anywhere. And having this kind of a partner checking you helps. It does slow things down, but it's very important in these kind of situations to be able to um, clearly show uh, to each other that you are properly attired. Um, we have, um, this is a bit more um, specific to our unit where we actually keep the surgeons, try to keep the surgeons out during intubation and extubation to reduce the number of people within the main operating theater um, during the time of maximal aerosolization. Um, and we try to keep them out for about 10 minutes or so um, during intubation and extubation. This is not always possible depending on your own hospital configuration, but that's something that we try to do over here. Uh, we try to bring our own, we try to leave our own personal material uh, out of the theater as well. And the key thing would be your handphones and cellular phones. Um, so we leave them with external team members. For those on call, uh, we get someone else to take all, to field all the calls while 
the team operating on the COVID patient is uh, operating. Um, some of the difficulties we have faced in these uh, by doing this is that certainly when you are allocating time for surgery, you need a longer step up and stand down time. So don't overbook your cases into a list. Uh, project equipment needs well in advance, um, but don't oversupply either because when you oversupply, because when you oversupply, you may need to clean quite a bit as well. Um, and always have a set of runners who can run in, who can run who you can communicate with, and so that they can run to get equipment rather than. OT staff leaving the theatre physically and going to get equipment. In that sense, you minimise this cross-transference of droplets out external to the theatre. So to summarise this very brief introduction and workflow drills for the operating theatre, have a clear ingress and egress plan from the operating theatre, rehearse this with all staff, including security, environmental services, have a huddle with your anaesthetist, surgeons, scrubs and circulating nurses, uh, one of my colleagues later will be talking about what to, how do you do CPR and code blue drills for operative patients. And lastly, this is an operational concern. There's not a teaching moment. So use uh, trained and effective staff um, for, uh, for these kind of procedures as well. And I think that's my last slide. I'll be happy to take any questions from either the chat or anyone live as well.